with highs from the mid-60s to around 70. Pullman 64, 71 in Lewiston. Good afternoon. I want to welcome everybody to the City of Moscow's Public Works and Finance Committee meeting. This is the Monday, April 13th meeting. Everybody uh, here, I think everybody knows, John Weber, myself, Wayne Krause, Art Betke, and Gary is gone, so we have Jen Pifter sitting in for Gary and doing a fine job, I might add. So the very first thing we have is going to be the approval of the March 23rd minutes. I move approval of the minutes. And John wasn't here, so I'll second it, and the minutes will stand approved. Uh, next item is Don Palmer, and he's uh, bringing our monthly disbursement report. You made it. I did. We had some uh, copier issues, and I didn't realize that till just a little while ago. But um, here's the check registers. If you want to pass a couple of those out, to each other, each of you. It's still warm off the press. Toasty. <laughs> just off the press. Of course, these were all part of our packet too. Right, electronically, I think. Um, so the disbursements report is for the month of uh, March 2015, or the end of, and we had $1,855,287.59 in expenditures for the month. Um, the categories for $1,728,960, it represents 93% of these expenses, and they are as follows. Professional services was $106,459. This includes JUB for Southwest Trunk Line Improvement for 66000 Keller for booster stations, and some other miscellaneous work. Sanitation was $243,522, which is about normal. Uh, monthly payments is a new category that... Uh, um, used to be called grants, and, and Cassie, um, I just now noticed it. Anyway, it's Heart of the Arts, Humane Society, and the Magar Building Rent. So that's what those are. Re recurring expenses. And, yeah. yeah, and she decided to just label them monthly expenses. But if you don't know what they are, that's what it is. Um, I don't know if you have a preference of leaving it at grants or just leave it as monthly I don't expenses. Like, I don't like grants because it's not a grant. It's, yeah. It's, I, I okay. like the term recurring expenses. Okay, so then we'll leave it at that. I'll tell you, good job. Supplies is normal. It's 37950 Constructions, uh, 92511 of which 89000 is related to the community ball fields. We're starting to wrap that up. Vehicles, uh, Chev Equinox, 20352 Payroll, 905195 Parts, $34,461. These are mostly water meters. Utilities. $153,194. I might note that that's double what it's normally been, and the reason it is is because we had, um, um, or Vista had made a change to their billing practices, and it really impacted us hard. So we would not pay them until they got it fixed um, because it didn't classify those correctly in how we can allocate to our funds. We worked with Paul Kimmel to get that straightened out. He did a great job in get, getting it figured out for us. And, and actually, I can't remember if I was even uh, suggesting Cassie go up there and, and make some changes, but I think that they were able to nail those down. So it seems now that they're they're working okay for us. So instead of being... Grouped together, they are now separated out so that uh, you have an idea of where they should be. Uh, well, they have always, yeah, they've always been separated out. But when they did this change, it grouped them, and we couldn't figure out the grouping. There was no rhyme or reason. So, um, <coughs> yeah, for if you have residents, it was a great idea. But if you're a business like ours, where you have to allocate to different funds. Um, they, you didn't know what the address was a street light or a, um, you know, a signal or something. And so it matters to us about how we build that or even a, you know, maybe a booster station or a, versus a street light. We didn't know what the heck it was. So, um, anyway, Paul worked hard on getting that fixed for us and it is now done. So that was great. Um, Equipment forty one thousand seven hundred four dollars, eighteen thousand 
uh, is play uh, swimming pool related stuff. The moose, half payment on the moose, and and some chase chairs and and some so there was some playground equipment as well improvements uh seventy seven thousand eight hundred and fifty nine dollars uh, a lot of well work and some work out at the wastewater treatment plant those totals uh a million seven hundred twenty eight thousand nine hundred and sixty dollars for the month of march do you have any questions here's uh everything looked pretty normal nothing in yeah. nothing really extraordinary have a pen you want us to use? Oh, sure. Special. We're on track, as usual. Next, um, we have the quarterly financial reports done, but we have a full agenda, so you'll be expecting that on the next uh, public works finance meeting. It goes through the end of March, okay. so we'll be talking about that at the next meeting. Okay, very good. Thank you, Don. You bet. Lisa Anderson Scott Bontranker is going to be talking next about the Idaho Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, our ongoing pedestrian curb ramp grant program. Curb ramp grant program. <laughs> Say that three times. <laughs> nice. Good afternoon. Hi, guys. So this is our um, fourth round of um, application funding to the Idaho Transportation Department for curb ramps that are on the state highways, so State Highway 8 and 95 in Moscow. And this is actually part of ITD's um, transition plan, like the one that we have where we need to go through and make sure that our public facilities in the public right-of-way are ADA compliant. And so engineering went through and um, looked at the next set of um, curb ramps that had the highest priorities and mm -hmm. I will let Scott go ahead and tell you about those locations and what will be involved. Yeah, the particular locations we chose this time were ranked high on their list which is all on Washington Street. We got uh, one on Washington and 8th. We've got the uh, sorry, I'm out of order here. The two on 7th Street and then the two up on 6th Street. And these particular locations to make them ADA compliant is going to involve more work than we have on with ones in the past. These ones will actually require using the technique of, of bulbing them out. So as it comes off of the slope of the hills there, we'll have to flatten things out so we can actually meet the correct slopes and grades out there. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a challenge in. Yeah, these ones will still be a little bit of a challenge. So normally in the past we've applied for quite a quite a few more ramps under the under mm -hmm. each category, but this year we're the costs on these are going to be much higher because of what has to be done. So we also included in your packet a list of the ones that we've done in the past. So how many we'll, new ones are we doing this year then? Just it's the five, right? Or six? Yeah, yeah. six. Mm -hmm. Five. Five. That right. Well, one of them is going to be on the southwest corner of Eighth and Washington, down by the hospital. That's one of the ones that's proposed. So it's a total of five then. It'd be a total six, six with that I'd one. Six. Probably put six five on my one. right up okay. tonight. Except that looks like northeast. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <coughs> so it should say six on my right up. Place that number. Um, so the applications are due here next Friday, the twenty fourth. On the twenty fourth. Yeah. So we'll, and we don't know how long they'll continue to run this program. We have more we can do, so we'll just continue to apply each year. And um, just a reminder that uh, it's our own in kind as engineering and design and construction management. So, and they provide the cost for the general contractor. Okay. John. Uh, Fine. I was wondering a little bit. And, um, Scott explained having to smooth things out at the bottom of the hill is going to take 
a little bit more work and yeah. they're for a little bit more money. And Anything, Art? Nope, it looks good to me. Press okay. on. Well, we of course put this forward with a recommendation for approval and on the consent agenda. I think it would work just fine. Hey, Scott's going to stay with us. And uh, now we're going to talk about the actual sidewalk. sidewalk program bid results and a contract award. Yeah, the next one up is uh, the 2015 sidewalk program, which is very similar to the past three years that we've done this and had pretty good success with our own projects and also with assisting the public on their projects. So again, this year it's a... Uh, we put out this program to solicit a contract to local concrete contractors to get some bid item pricing to assist the public with being able to do sidewalk and ADA ramp improvements. And uh, the results this time came in probably about the lowest we've ever seen for bid item pricing. This particular year we had three bids, one from Knox Concrete, one from McCall's, Classic construction and the other one from Curtis Concrete with the low bid coming from Knox Concrete again for the fourth year in a row at 28500 which is based upon a fair value of items, but the, uh, the amount of work will be dependent upon participation in the program. So the recommendation for this is to word it to... Uh, Knox Concrete with their low bid for it. John? Scott, do you have any idea um, other than maybe uh, the contractor that bid 73665 versus 28.5, why there's such a discrepancy? Well, they have on here a real high amount for mobilization, which is, it's tough to know exactly. I mean, we give a guaranteed minimum amount of work that they'll yeah. be receiving, but with this type of work, it's pretty much on call. We try to organize things, so we group things to make it easier on the contractor to be able to come in and knock out a few different locations at a time. But there could be times where it's replacing a panel here or replacing a panel there. So these contractors are bidding on the risk that they would have to take with it and how much time they have available, you know, over the the contract period to get the work done. Whereas uh, Curtis Concrete has not participated with us on much stuff, but Knox Concrete and McCall's have done a lot of work with us, and they know our ability to organize and our ability to be able to put together all the stuff for them. Okay. I see that uh, Knox Concrete is also doing some work on the at the university right now, so they're pretty much mobilized. And uh, there again, you say they know us and we know them. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Art? Yeah, so in the past, all the work that they've been doing has been up to snuff as far as the city is concerned. Yeah. Uh, a more general question about uh, contracts. Uh, are there performance clauses involved for quality work as well as temporal performance? There is. It's all in there that, you know, if it doesn't meet certain specifications or anything, it has to be redone. And timeliness. And timing and everything. And also it comes with a two-year warranty with the side, sidewalk program. And you guys, the city, uh, I don't want to say supervises, but you look in on them regularly as yeah, things we, are moving along so that... Uh, we do the full inspection and contract administration of all of it. Okay. Sounds good to me. Hey, okay. Same thing. We will recommend approval and, and send that on the consent agenda also. Now, Scott's <laughs> still with us, and this is going to be an interesting discussion I think we're going to be having here. Uh, this is the cured in place pipe rehabilitation for the fiscal year 2015, the bid results, and actually maybe lack of contract award. Now, this is interesting. All these years I've been doing this, I don't think I've ever seen this happening. So we have Tyler Palmer also joining us here. So let's uh, let's talk about this. Fill us in. Yeah, for this one, the cured in place pipe rehabilitation, you know, we have a lot of sewer mains out there that are to the point where they're leaky or kind of decrepit, falling apart. Yeah, we get we, we 
the, it's, it's a good process to cure it in place because it keeps us from having to open up the ground. We don't have to do a massive excavation. And so it's, it's basically a, a sleeve that is put into the pipe. It has a resin that it then cures, and, and that becomes the pipe. It actually cures, and in, in it's structural itself independent of the pipe. Um, so then whatever happens with the pipe, you know, an old clay pipe, it can just basically degrade around the pipe itself, the cured-in-place pipe that we've now put in, and it keeps us from having to dig up an area. And so where it's, it's especially beneficial is areas where, you know, we may have backyard mains, um, you know, places where we really would rather not dig. And, it, and it's very cost effective, um, but it's also limited in its potential uses. We have to have pipe that um, we can't have a lot of lips in the pipe because you know any lips or bellies, this 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 product will just follow whatever the pipe's currently doing. So it has to be pretty structurally sound as far as in line and lined up and on the grade that we want it to be on. Um, and so it's 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 a good it's a good product, um, but th those those are the uses that we had with this year's bid. Um, the bid came in higher than we'd anticipated. This is a product that, that's used in the area. Several municipalities um, in our region use this product. Um, in, in speaking with the bidders, we, uh, w w the feedback that we're getting is the reason that it was high is because we'd included some six-inch pipe in the contract. And the six-inch pipe is uh, apparently far more difficult because to recut out the laterals. They, they, they have a machine that goes up into the line. So when the line is sealed off and then a machine will go up and they basically mark and then cut out the laterals so that the service laterals from the, the residential properties can come in or from the private properties can then enter the main line. And that's, that's where we ran into the problems that we had quite a bit of six-inch line in. And so they have to budget pretty high because I guess with the difficulties in cutting, they have to plan on having to dig up their cutter wherever it may or may not have problems. So um, that's why we're recommending that we reject this bid. Um, we're going to, uh, we hope to take a new look at this and augment some of our different sizes, the larger sizes that we'd like to see done and potentially put this back out um, in hopes that if we put it out with eight, primarily eight and 10 inch pipe and remove the six inch pipe that we'll see a far more friendly number for the city you know, in looking at the information that you gave us, we had, of course, two bidders which were substantially higher, almost a hundred thousand dollars higher, eighty thousand dollars anyway, <laughs> higher than you know, our engineers bidding. But when I'm looking at that, you know, I'm thinking on the on the six inch, they were not that much higher than what we'd anticipated. They were like eight thousand dollars higher, not quite that. Actually, they were really high on the eighteen inch. They were twenty four and nine thirty three thousand dollars higher, and that's on the eighteen inch. So, to me, that kind of says, well, the six inch maybe wasn't. Yeah, plain. some. <laughs> and Scott can elaborate on this more. Sometimes when when they when they'll build in their costs, they they do look at the project as a whole, and so okay. it's it's not always indicative exactly where they put things. Sometimes they don't want to sticker shock, and so it'll be okay. Well, we'll we know we're, we want to we need to pad this by X amount. Let's spread this out and distribute this in a different way so that it's not as shocking. And so that's that's often what's happened. Is that I, I would suspect that's the case yeah. in this situation. Yeah, and also the 18-inch diameter. When we look at the other local municipalities that are doing the same thing, they typically are going to about a 12-inch size maximum. So the 18-inch is going to use more so material. I'm trying to picture this. We've got a we've got a six, eight, ten, twelve, whatever inch size pipe. Okay, and so then we push a pipe into that one. How much smaller, ultimately, if we start off with an 8-inch, and if we do this, how much smaller do we really have? It, it does affect the diameter. It's pretty minimal. The, 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 um, the pipe width is similar to a, a standard sewer pipe like an SDR-35, which is a plastic pipe that we use for sewer. And so um, I don't know what the, what the pipe width on SDR-35 is. Typical pipe like, width for that size is maybe you know, less than a quarter inch. Yeah. Okay. So it's a little, little smaller, but not that much. Yeah. Art, you had a question? Well, that was one of them. Okay. Um, the other one is, um, is this a temporally dependent process? Do you have to do it in the summer, or is this something you got 55-degree dirt down there year-round? Is this something where they might be more interested in going on it at another time of year instead of right now? The, the work for this, you can go ahead, Scott. When we actually talked with the contractors about it, they had told us that it's not temporal dependent and that 
it just comes down to the safety of their workers. So if it's freezing cold out, ice on the roads, that's their main concern, not so much the heating of the pipe when it's actually lined in there because they use steam to heat it up to, to make the resin bond. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's more of just for the worker safety outside of the pipe zone of where they're Shoot, feeding the pipe. Last winter in. would have been delightful for them. Yes. Have they had a good time? Mm. Anything, no, I, I, when they do that, I'm going to go watch. Yes. It's go, pretty neat. Just, it just is pretty neat. How so they do it. Mm -hmm. question that I have is, is you know, the, our engineers' bids versus the lowest bid was, here again, $80,000 off. This is work we have to get done. Where are we at with this? Do we just hope that we bid it again and hope they come in cheaper? Well, and they recently had just put together one of the ones that had bid for us had recently put a bid in for um, Coeur d'Alene again. They put in a bid for Coeur d'Alene every year. And our itemized numbers compared to Coeur d'Alene's even this year are completely different. But Coeur d'Alene has a much, larger variety, or a much larger amount of 8 and 10 inch compared to what we had for the 6 and 18 inch. So... They had told us they'd be a lot more competitive in their bid if we scale back down on, like, say, the 18-inch and remove the 6-inch altogether so we remove the risk from their contract. So so our, our hope, Wayne, is that we're able to um, augment the numbers of the 8 and 10, which is their bread and butter. That's, mm -hmm. that's the stuff that they do regularly, the crews <coughs> know how to work with. And so if we can eliminate some of the outliers, eliminate the 6 entirely, and perhaps diminish the 18, and then augment the 8 and 10, we, we've been told that we can suspect a far more friendly bid. So what do we do, what do, we do with our 6-inch that needs? The 6-inch the, the, the at that point, we really are going to have to slate for our replacement. It's yeah. going to have to be open trench replacement. Yeah, okay. Or possibly pipe bursting you know, yeah, some we'll other put, technique other than this one. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, there, there are alternatives with the 6-inch, like pipe bursting and things like that, depending on the pipe material and, and that. But it'll, it'll be a, a different uh, – we'll have to look at different alternatives than this. Folks that have, that have their own sewer lines as they run, across, run under their property to the city property, when they have problems with their sewer lines and have to be replaced, and particularly if they can't be dug up underneath the house – because it's under a concrete slab or something, they generally use pipe bursting for something like that. Yes, mm -hmm. and so it's it's something that we sh we've used it in the past, and it mm -hmm. works pretty well yes. too. So. Yeah, that is an alternative. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Anything else? No, I guess we will guess. not recommend uh, acceptance of any bids on this, and urge staff to go forth and rebid it with the stipulations you discussed. Yep. Okay. Can do that. Okay. Yeah. Consent agenda on that one also. Well, guys, you, you just happen to be our, our main players here today. Next one is the 2015 Pavement Management Program Bid Award. And once again, we're a little disappointed in the results. Go ahead. We were. This, this was, uh, as we discussed previously, uh, it's a, a pilot project. Um, we're really hoping to be able to use this asphalt rubber chip to fill a big gap in our toolbox, to be able to, to um, treat roads that otherwise we'd just have to kind of say, Adios to and, and you know so there's not a lot we can do until these are replaced. Um, surface treatments are far more cost effective, and so we're we're hopeful and still are that we can we can um, use this process here in Moscow uh, through our our co-op, which is our our Inland Northwest Street Maintenance Co-op that we've formed with other um, governmental agencies in the area, including the universities in several cities. We had planned to put out a package together primarily with the city of Lewiston as our partner. The University of Idaho had a small portion that they wanted to add, and the city of Pullman was looking at potentially doing a project. Um, Pullman's uh, budget didn't work out this year, but Lewiston was still planning on putting out a large project. They had um, some major unanticipated repairs that really eroded their budget. So we, had pl we were thinking that you know we may have to hold off. We just can't put out a big enough project independently to get down the costs. Um, as we were looking at this, um, Chelan County put out a very large project, um, and then the city of West Richland also put out a, a moderately sized project. And so we thought that with those two still putting it out and getting the, the work closer to us, that it was worth putting it out to bid to see if that would help bring the cost down and we could still get our pilot project out. Um, we were still optimistic um, until the contractors, one of the big problems they ran into um, is locating aggregate with with the quantities that we need getting someone to 
do a specialty production of this aggregate would have been difficult for them, especially having not worked with any of the crushers in this area before. Um, and so th that was really one of the problems we ran into. Richland was late getting their, pro their project out, and then the aggregate issue made it so that the costs got pushed up really high. Um, and so w where we're at on this one is we are recommending that we, we don't accept this and that we uh, continue to work with uh, Lewiston is hopeful that they'll be able to put out a package next year, the package that they plan on putting out with us this year. And if we're able to combine our forces on that um, and hopefully augment the size of ours a little bit, um, we'll be able to get them here and not be reliant on somebody too far away from us to get the prices <coughs> down. And, in the, and then it gives us time to work with our local providers on the aggregate question too and make sure we have that hammered out. Mm -hmm. I just, I remember you uh, coming in front of the council and discussing this uh, type of uh, topical and hopefully you said at the time that it would work well for us and uh, I think you're right I think it will but at this dollar amount um, it doesn't nope. but if we could um, like you say get together with somebody else or add two years of our process together we might be able to get that uh, price down to the point where we can uh, actually do a significant amount of our overlay and uh, save some money at the same time. So I agree with your recommendation that uh, putting it out now is not a real good idea. All right. What happens to the streets in the meanwhile? Are they going to be able to limp along? My question. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the, the, the streets that we've selected for these, we think, you know, they will all be candidates for next year. It's not something that we think one year is going to make the difference between being able to conduct the treatment or not. Um, so I, I believe that we'll be able to take our current candidates for this year and then um, looking toward next budget year, uh, potentially add some additional candidates. We have lots of streets that we could yeah. use it on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't think that this one year will will have any of them degrade to, degrade to the point that we can't use the process on. So this year we'll just patch and plug and. Well, that's that's we'll, we'll probably be back before you this year. We're, we 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 had a meeting last week. Um, we've we're gathering some information, doing some core sampling on some streets, um, and we'll probably be back with an alternative for this year, um, and then look toward next year. Is some of this money going to be? We're going to try to carry that forward in next year's budget. The, the, we're looking at a few alternatives. I mean, the hope would be, yeah, that we could we could carry at least some forward so that we could grow the package that we put out. Um, but we're looking at at, at uh, what our alternatives are with with what we need to get done and what we can do in a, the most cost effective way. We've already discussed, and we all know the fact that Third Street in front of East City Park is yes. You know, we're going to we're going to lose a car in there one of these days. That's that's the area that's getting core drilled right now, and yeah. so we're. We're trying to get some solid numbers on that. We're looking at, at water and sewer work that potentially needs to happen there so we can see how much the street fund, how much of an impact that would have. Um, but that's the primary alternative that we're looking at right now. And, Todd, are you, uh, when you approach this whole situation, you don't wait until the street is all but gone before you try to do something about it. That's that's the hope. The, the earlier we can catch it so that we're doing the equivalent of oil changes instead of engine overhauls, we, we want to be treating our roads routinely and, and keeping our good roads good. Start the treatment when they're in good condition, keep them flexible, keep them sealed, and keep them in good condition. And that's, that's really what our goal for our pavement management program is. I agree with you. Okay. Yeah. Well, Me too. Once again, we'll send see another one to the consent see you agenda soon with, with a recommendation of we'll no bid. <laughs> Thanks, gentlemen. Well, that was two disappointing things that we had to discuss, but that's all part of doing business. But now we have one that is, is I think is going to be kind of an exciting thing to talk about. Kevin Lilly with our state local agreement uh, for the North Polk Street Safety Improvement Project. This is phase two. Kevin, go for it. This is happy news for now. Yeah, it is. For now. For now. <laughs> Don't say for now. I'll just say this is good. <clears throat> you may remember uh, a few weeks ago we brought you this state local agreement for project development. This is uh, phase two of our North Polk Street job. And this will be the final agreement with ITD for construction of that project. Last July, phase one uh, state local for construction was approved. And we 
ponied up our share of that cost at that point, and now uh, to finish the project, uh, fully fund the project, I should say, uh, this agreement needs to be executed. And we, the plan shows for us to to send our match for that part of the project, which is ninety nine hundred dollars with this agreement, and then uh, at that point. LTAC will be able to advertise the project for construction for this year. Makes sense to me. I think we should press on and send in the check for 9900 bucks. Absolutely. John, got something? No, that uh, I occasionally end up on that particular area of, of street, and it's, uh, you know, Kind of like a roller coaster out there, side to side and up and down. So, uh, if we're going to do that, if I'm thinking of the right spot, this is uh, primarily well. It was intended as a safety improvement project and primarily for pedestrians. Uh, so it was sidewalks. You know, the section of Polk with no sidewalk along yeah. the shop. Yes, and all the way down to F Street. Yeah, and right. this will go all the way up north and connect with the sidewalk. Yes. Yeah, there uh, there is a piece in between that we're going to fill in, right? Yeah, it'll go up to rodeo and then from rodeo I'll also fill in that last missing gap to up just to a rodeo. few. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's already sidewalks on the on the west side. Yes, so this is going to go from East Street up past the shop to where it meets that sidewalk, and then that other missing piece from rodeo, a couple oh, hundred feet right. north there to is, that. Yeah, yeah, there is yeah. a piece to, to the side. to the north. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Well, I'm excited about that because I can remember three years ago uh, before we had anything even planned on that and going to Gary Reedner and talking about this, this young mother with a three-year-old, and I think I talked to you about it, and a, and a child in a baby carriage, and she was kind of right there at the entrance to the city shop off of Polk, and there's traffic going by, and she's trying to figure out how to get out of the way, and somebody was trying to come out of the shop, and, and she had nowhere to go, and it was like this this was something that was bad because we have so much population out on that north end of Polk Street now. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to see this. Yeah. I think this is great, and especially getting it done this year. So yes, yes, thank yes. you with that, and we're going to rec definitely recommend moving this forward. In fact, if you two don't have any objection to it, I'd like to see it put on the regular agenda just so that people know about it. They know that what we're doing here because I think this is a this is an important project. Is yeah. there any disagreement there? No, no, I Kevin, I, uh, I think you'd have you'd be here anyway, so for that meeting. The council can be, meeting. Can be. Can, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Let everybody know things are not always depressing. Well, we put a lot of stuff on the consent agenda, you know, that's just kind of routine things. But I think there's some important things that people need to know that we're doing. That we, you know, we do. Have, apparently, there's not enough good stuff on TV that people do watch us. So, <laughs> yeah. you know. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> guess who? Guess who's still here, Kevin? Now Scott's been here this whole time. Well, Scott can stay, although he knows anything about power generators yeah, or not. He's but about as much as I do, which is, yeah. Okay, fire station number one, the emergency power generator replacement situation. Yes, we uh, facilitated for the fire department, facilitated the process of getting an electrical engineer to uh, design and spec out the generator that's needed at fire station one. And we recently com completed that process and opened bids. And the low bidder was Grop of Moscow. We had, uh, I believe we had three bidders. Yeah. Yeah, we had three bidders, uh, two local and one from southern Idaho. And Grop was a low bid at $54,448. So we would like to get this awarded. There is a schedule in the contract that will not allow the contractor to begin until the volunteers, resident volunteers, are pretty much gone for the summer. And then uh, they'll get in there and get that done. It has to be completed by August 1st. Uh, something, there is a several week lead time between ordering the generator. The, once we award this, they'll get the, the generator ordered right away. and and then get it installed this summer. One of the things that uh, you may be aware of is there was a couple of the council members that brought up uh, questions about utilizing the, 
the emergency generator we have out here for City Hall, uh, maybe making it portable or being able to utilize it for that. We know it's 16 years old, hasn't been used much. Is there Was there any discussion or any enlightenment that you'd like to give us about that? Um, through the grapevine, I heard from uh, Mr. Flowers that it would be a bad idea to not have power uh, at the city hall in the, in the event of a power outage. Did you? We have a couple of things. City hall is the primary or one of the primary command center um, facilities for an, an event, an emergency of some sort. And so maintaining power to this building is seen as part of a key part of our disaster management plan, emergency management plan process. Um, that's true. Then one of the other issues that we have, too, is our fiber optics network that we have here, that we rent out fiber optics lines and they, and they head here. And if we lose power here, then these fiber optics that are going out to the different businesses, they would lose that contact, mm -hmm. that communication ability also. Mm -hmm. Correct. So um, I think some of the other discussions were a portable, making this unit portable, but knowing the timeliness of moving it from one place to another, especially in the event of, emer of an emergency, um, could be a huge consideration. Sure. So. Art, did you have something? No, I didn't, but I think Les does. I see Les is mm -hmm. there. I don't know. So. Did you have something to add to this, Les, that we haven't thought about? Well, actually, Jen touched on, on the first thing I was going to mention, which is the um, the fact that this is the emergency operations center right here right. during um, larger events. And so we need to be able to maintain operation here even during a power outage for those types of situations. Uh, something else that Tyler had pointed out in that string of emails this morning is that this existing unit out here is, sits on top of its fuel tank, and so making that into a portable unit is somewhat problematic, even if it was desirable to do so. So there's a number of reasons um, that you know, sharing one between these two critical facilities is probably not a very practical approach. I see Mayor Lambert stepped up. He has a couple of comments possibly also. Here's my here's my comment because we had there was a lot of interaction amongst the council members uh, on the need and this sort of thing and what, uh, other possibilities and what I want to point out was um, you know we're working on a strategic planning and part of the strategic planning is asking the question why and I think this is a terrific example of that so that it can be discussed out now. Uh, and these are the sort of things, the direction we're headed with a, a strategic planning, as you guys all well know. And I just wanted to make a comment on it. Yep. That's the kind of conversations that we need to have. So, why? Yep. I uh, one of the things that we haven't touched on in this particular discussion yet is uh, the cost. We're talking about uh, essentially uh, fifty-five thousand dollars to put a new one in and leave this one where it is and make it portable. Oh, the other option would be possibly to make that one portable. By the time that uh, a trailer was built, complete with a uh, fuel tank, complete with uh, male and female ends so that you could plug the power into various places, uh, I think we could easily end up spending twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars making a trailer that would do that, and then we would still be leaving this building um, at risk for a period of time until we were able to get that piece of equipment here or somewhere else. So well, then, the other thing that speaks to the obvious too is if we had a catastrophic power failure in town. What happens if the fire department and city hall lost power? And we got one generator? Yep. Yeah. No. We didn't really fix a lot. So, well, Gary? I apologize for getting here late. I assume you guys would take a little longer to get through your agenda. And just came back from the university. Um, one of the things I know Kevin's mentioned it about the information systems uh, infrastructure in City Hall. Uh, we have not only our own infrastructure, all the servers in the city, except the ones that are out at the wastewater treatment plant or housed downstairs. We also have contracts with several other providers uh, who lease space from us. The battery backup for those, I'm told by Jesse Flowers, our IS director, is is about an hour. So that could be critical. We would lose functionality if that was the case. And in case it wasn't mentioned before, and I apologize if I'm repeating, the reason that generator was put here back in 1999 was in anticipation of Y2K. Uh, we were still 
uh, treating City Hall as a command center location. And if it comes to that again, it can be used as that again. So some redundancy in the system, I think, makes sense. Um, and I don't know if um, these gentlemen have talked about it. The generator itself is 16 years old now. So certainly it's got useful life left in it. But is it one of those things that you want to stick a bunch of extra money in to make it portable to have something that perhaps doesn't match the need overall? So anyway. We don't. <laughs> well, and I agree with Mayor Lambert. I think asking the question makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. But um, getting the right answer makes a lot of exactly. sense, too. Yep. Precisely. Well, it's, you know, there's a perception, I think, sometimes that the public has that staff does such an excellent job and a very competent job of, of bringing things forward to us for our approval. A lot of times it looks like we rubber stamp things. Well, that's because... They have asked and answered the questions exactly. before they get to us. But so the, with the strategic planning that we're doing, exception of care. asking why <laughs> is going to go a long ways too. Certainly, towards alleviating that concern. Yep. So, all right, yeah, we're going to move this uh, forward to full council. Um, here again, I think we should put this on the regular agenda. You could go on to consent, but uh, I think it's something that should be voiced out to the public so that they know what we're doing. Okay, you're here. Okay. And, and Gary, if yes, sir. in the meantime, or if uh, we could get some information on just how long that they figure the useful life of the, of the gener generator that we already have, you know. The one it, out here? Yeah, okay. I mean, is it good for 180 years or is it good for six more months? Well, that's Probably, I would guess, predicated on a availability of replacement parts Ooh. if something goes down and number of hours on it, which I don't think it has very many hours on it. Tyler has some information, probably. I can, got I can speak to that a little bit. Our, our, our large generators are on a 25 year term in our replacement schedule. Um, we have several large generators that have gone beyond that term. That's just when we really start looking seriously at it as we go through the budgeting process. Um, Wayne's spot on when he says really replacement parts become our biggest obstacle as they age. Um, the motors that don't see a lot of hours on them, sometimes that's more problematic than motors that see a normal amount of usage. Um, but replacement parts really becomes the obstacle. But it is a 25-year term in our replacement schedule on those. You know, one of our really big generators that we have is the wastewater treatment plant. How old is that one? I'd anybody have to look know? at a point. I'm not sure. I'm Gary, not sure do you on that. less? Anybody oh, know how old that, that one is? Part of uh, phase three. Yeah, 2000, 2001, something okay. like that. Roughly the same age as the one sitting out back here. Okay. So that was it's almost big enough to run the entire city of Moscow. <laughs> it's a big generator. It's big. <laughs> so, all right. Can we drag this out any longer? We still have 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, gentlemen. Very Very good. Good. Anything? Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Yes, sir. Kevin. You've been most efficient this afternoon. Yep. Well, then, there's no other business to come before this committee. We stand adjourned. Thank Sweet. you. Sweet.